Vince McMahon for doing some of the shady crap that he does? Oh, absolutely. You know, with the, the BS cease and desist uh, letters and emails that they send out when you use a photo on a poster and, you know, all that bull crap uh, to getting some of your videos blanked on Facebook because they own the rights to the background music. But when push comes to shove, you know, some of these wrestlers, they worked everywhere. You know, they've worked at VFWs, Elks Lodges. They've worked everywhere. So you can't really hold it against the wrestlers, per se, than you can, you know, like you said, they hate Vince, but they did they, like, hold it against the talent? Um, no, and, and I agree 100% with you. You know, you know, one of the things that's funny is this is the first generation ever that you've got wrestlers that are coming up that never went through a territory. Um, unless you count NXT as a territory, and I think they've built that in the last year or two to make it a territory. Right. But originally when Florida Championship Wrestling and then later NXT was started, they weren't even using wrestlers. They were going out and getting fitness models, mm -hmm. going out and getting former college football players that failed or were injured, and they weren't getting wrestlers. And then you look at that last generation, which I looked at, which was the CM Punks, the Cole Cabanas, um, obviously the Shield, obviously guys like that mm -hmm. who got the bologna sandwich payoffs, who got the stiffs from shit promoters, who got, I can curse, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, who got the, the, the shit paydays from guys and, and, and stuff like that. And listen, you know, we've all been in a boat where something's happened. I mean, I tell the story all the time that I did a show once that was supposed to be a sold show, and the day of the show, the check bounced. And I went to uh, Car Cash and sold my pickup truck to pay my guys. You know, we're, we've all experienced the fucking in wrestling. Mm -hmm. But this generation is pampered. And if you look at it, you have a bunch of guys who came up with the best training, the best rings, the best crash pads, a writer's mentality. They're not allowed to speak. They're not allowed to be creative. As much as I disagree with Jim Cornette, and I think he's out of his fucking mind and off his rocker, 90% <laughs> of what he says about wrestling, I agree with. Right. And when you listen to the man talk and he tells stories about, okay, we're short tonight, referees wrestling, and, or they would not smarten up referees back in the day for years or months or whatever it took to, to make sure they protected the business and the guy was going to last before they taught him the business. And now, now you look today and you got guys that have natural God-given ability like Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins and Bray Wyatt, and they're, they're hot for a month and then they suck. Right. And it's not their fault. They've got writers that just don't know what they're doing, um, and, and it just buries guys. And, it, and it's really weird to watch. You know, it's you turn on the TV for five minutes, and, 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 and I'm glad the women revolution's taking place, and they deserve it, and they work hard. But can any of them cut a promo? Are any of them any good on a mic? You know, everybody wants Nina Jacks fired. Oh, she broke Becky's nose. How many times in the '70s or '80s did you see a jobber leave the ring busted? Uh, you know, I remember watching George the Animal Steel he used to finish guys with a flying hammer lock. And I could tell you three or four guys who in the middle of the ring, their shoulders either broke or popped out of the socket. And all that did was enhance the mystique of that guy's crazy and he can possibly kill you someday. Right. And instead, we got a bunch of sugar plum fairies running around now that want that poor girl fired. And they all hate the world. Meanwhile, the toughest bitch out of all of them, Becky, stood there, took the bloody beating, stood there smile with blood all over her face and is it me or did she come across as a real badass after that uh and she and she's playing off of it too i mean while she's you know sitting out until she's medically cleared to get in the ring um you know she's uh took advantage of that situation and so is nia Jax because it, it got her literally back over as a heel again absolutely and, and that's the wrestling business that's the wrestling business you need heels, you need faces. The lines have been blurred for so long mm -hmm. about everybody in the world, and it's about merchandising and not getting people over as characters. And, you know, I'm sure you're a fan. You're Randy Macho Man Savage's biggest fan. We all know that, right? <laughs> yeah. How cool is Randy Savage back in the day when he came out with those robes and those biceps and those glasses? Yep. And I have a friend of mine who just passed away, and the, the greatest story ever was we were at the Meadowlands, and Joey Soto got arrested because he ran down the aisle and dumped the beer on Randy Savage's head, and Randy turned around and punched him in the face and knocked him three rows over a chair. And that, not that you should go pour beer over anybody's head, but you know what? Wrestling was protected. And you know what? If Randy Savage was alive today and somebody poured a beer on him and Miss Elizabeth and they punched him in the face, he'd be fired. Yeah. yeah. There would be an apology letter. 
and the mystique of the business would be tarnished. And the mystique, the, 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 the polish has been taken off the car, and I don't know if there's a way to fix that. Um, I don't think so, because when your C- COO of the company basically goes on a, a public forum and says that Kayfabe is dead, and I, I don't think he can recover from that. No, well, we can't recover from The Undertaker standing in New Jersey with Governor Christie at that, not Go- Governor Christie, I'm sorry, Christy Whitman, was it? Mm-hmm. And Vince McMahon when they announced it's no longer a sport. And there was The Undertaker standing there in his purple hat and his purple gloves, and he had his hand up, and it was in front of her face, and it was about money. The WWE did not want to pay taxes as a uh, sports entertainment, I'm sorry, as a sport, right, which right. would have been taxed, and the entertainment tax break was given to them in the state of New Jersey first. They deregulated the commission in New Jersey, and it allowed idiots to run shows from that point forward without without a commission. When I started running shows, we had commissions, and we had to pay, and we had to have blood tests, and you had to have a, your heart, and you had to have a doctor there, and you couldn't be a scumbag promoter because you had to post a bond, and if you sniff somebody, they took it out of your bond, and you were never out to, to, to promote again. Right. And the deregulation of wrestling has cost the business 20 years later. These are the effects of this stuff. You've got idiots running VFWs in front of three people. You've got little kids trying to put people through a fucking table in front of a hot fucking crowd. And you've got a seven-year-old kid, and no offense to, to, to their promoter, because I'm not bad-mouthing him. Everybody's living the wrestling dream. Right. And that wrestling dream used to be protected, and that's what the mystique was about the business. But instead, now, it's taken away, and any fucking idiot can run a wrestling show and get in a ring and have a, a, a mentally challenged kid do his fucking advertisements and do promos. And everybody sits back and laughs, but it's also what's wrong with the business. Because those mentally challenged people, and I'm not trying to be funny, right. those are the guys who used to buy the tickets. Now right. they're in the business. Yeah. Uh, and they still do. They still uh, are a big part of uh, independent wrestling crowds. Uh, they usually travel in, uh, you know, buses and stuff like that to, to go. Um, they look forward to that. It's kind of like their day out. But, um, you know, getting getting back to you saying how about, you know, everybody's living the dream. You know, what about some of these, uh, these internet sensations that have no wrestling training, but they get booked to um, independent wrestling shows to not only perform in the ring, but to, you know, put themselves over on their YouTube shows and uh, the company that they're working for as well. Well, listen, ticket sellers go back to the, to, to the early days of pro wrestling. And again, I'll go back to Jim Cornette, who's the greatest storyteller in wrestling. And again, I don't agree with any of his political nonsense or anything like that. But there's always been a place for people who come in and sold tickets. I'll tell you a great story. Dennis Corluzo and I are sitting in Lodi High School. Um, I believe it was 1994. And we're um, setting up the show. And a gentleman walked in, and he was as big as a house. He must have been five foot ten uh, by five foot ten wide, uh, <laughs> not overly muscular, but just a, gig- a gigantic figure. He had two guys with him, and we looked at him, and you know, when I'm talking about, they were pretty Italian, and, and we were like, we thought we were going to get robbed. And the guy walked in, and he said to us, uh, "Hey, who's the promoter here?" And I said, uh, "Me and me and him. Why? What's up?" And he said, "Can we talk to you in private?" And Dennis looked at me, and I looked at him, and we said, yeah, what's going on? And we walked outside a little cautious, and it turned out it was a gigantic mark named Vito Petta, and he had a suitcase with $10,000 in it. And he said, this is my town. Everybody here loves me. I'm from Italy. I got all of my friends coming here from Garfield, New Jersey, which was at the time a very Italian town. I want to wrestle, and I want to win the Italian heavyweight championship tonight. Here's a $10,000. You make that happen? Dennis looked at me and he winked and he goes, let me, let me find out if we're allowed to do something like that. Give me a minute. And he pulled me out in the hallway and he goes, if you set me up, motherfucker, and this is fake, I'll kill you. And I said, no, I don't even know this guy. And we walked inside and he handed us 10 grand. And later that night, he won a belt that we spray painted red and green on the front. And he was the Italian heavyweight champion. And he came back and did two more shows for us. And each time it was sold out with all his friends just coming to see this guy who literally would trip up the stairs on the way in the ring. So there's a, there's a history going back a hundred fucking years on having people like that. But the problem is it's got to be done in small shows, small batches, and mm-hmm. not your continued everyday crowd, not your every game, every show person. Right. And that's the problem now. There's nobody unique anymore. 
Well, you know, that all kind of gets back to the whole gimmick thing with wrestling and, you know, things are starting to get recycled. Like, is there really any gimmick out there that wrestling hasn't hit and tried to use? No, there's not. But let me ask you a question. Mm Mm-hmm. When you were growing up, you were, again, I'll go back to you because I know you're a fan. I know you personally. We've had many conversations. We do these conventions. We talk about stuff offline, and we, and we have fun. When you were, when I was a kid, I'm going to go back to George the Animal Steel. I'm going to go back to Black Jack Mulligan. I'm going to go back to some badass guys. I grew up in the era of the late 70s, early 80s, and I saw the entire thing. I was at WrestleMania 1. I watched the buildup. I was there with Sheiky Law beat the backland. I was there when Hogan became Hogan and Beach Sheik. But what was wrestling then? You looked at Kamala. He scared the shit out of you on the way to the ring. Yep. You looked at George the Animal Steel. You looked at Bruiser Brody, who came to the ring. You looked at Stan Hansen swinging a cowbell full rope. I remember Pro Wrestling USA at the Meadowlands. He was the AWA champion. He pulled in the parking lot in the back, and they realized it was him in a cab, and they blocked his cab. And he jumped out with his bull rope and started swinging it for people's heads, got three, four people down, clotheslined somebody to get in the door. <laughs> and it was real. And you were afraid of these people. And the good guy was Bob Backlund, or the good guy was Hulk Hogan. And you prayed at night that he would win. You don't want Hulk Hogan to lose his belt to somebody like Kamala, because he's, he's not from America, and he's a savage. Yep. And now you look and you see, what do you see? I mean, I don't even follow it's a cartoon. 90% of the Indies anymore. But what what do you see? You, you know? It's... I, I love I love my guys. I love GCW. I love, I, I love what, you know, Chad's doing. He's doing a great job building his brand. And, and you know, there's different guys out there. There's Create, uh, Creator Pro who does a phenomenal job. Look at Kevin Matthews. Why wasn't – and I know Kevin's gone through a lot of bullshit. And we've had our ups and downs. And um, I agree with him. I think you're an idiot. The Shining's great. But <laughs> – I, I have to say, this kid is a fucking monster with a creative mind and a, and a really, really, really talented mouth. And I don't mean that to be funny, mm-hmm. but he can cut a promo on somebody instantaneously, and he should have been a bigger star than he ever was. Those guys get it. And then you go and you look at somebody's, and I'm not bashing the guy, but Gino Caruso shows. Right. Where you've got 50 untrained guys on a show, and it's a joke. And you go there, and everyone's in sweatpants, and everybody's in a t-shirt, and as soon as their mom and dad realize their match is over, they leave in the crowd. By the time the main event comes on, the poor old saps, WWF guy, legend, there's 20 people left in the building. Yeah. I watched the gangster reunion the other night. Oh, I think okay. it was on your feed with Eric Sims, right? <laughs> I just now. I was going to bring that up. Again. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> New, New Jack and Masasa are two of the guys that I, I love New Jack, dude. You know, he's... He's a great fucking guy. I've been on many shows with him. I've, I've hung out with him. I've done him some favors. If he's needed some stuff, I've you know taken care of him behind the scenes with some uh, some yeah. And you know what? People don't know, and I'm going to blow his gimmick. He does a lot of work with kids. He coaches football. He does a lot of stuff behind the scene with youth, and, and he's actually a pretty decent guy. There's an image he portrays, but he's a pretty decent person. But he's a badass. And Mustafa came out jacked out of his mind and looked like a fucking tank with, with, with wrestling trunks on. And all of a sudden, they're wrestling two fucking guys. I look at it, and I go, who the fuck would book this? Where's Louis Ramos? Where's Steve Mack? Where's Danny Moss? Where is the New Heavenly Bodies? Where is a legit fucking tag team that they could have had, even if it was a five-minute match because they can't go, but give them somebody instead of two fucking broomsticks with long hair? It was a fucking joke. <laughs> and then we're wondering why people don't want to come back to shows. It, it, I just don't get it. You know, I don't get what people are trying to sell. You know, people go off on Danny and Brett for their GCW, and, and, and you know, Cornette hates him, and this one hates him, and, you know, this one, David Arquette got his throat cut. You know what? They're doing their little niche. They found their niche, and there's a following for it. Yep. Everyone else is just the same thing. Again, I'm not saying Creative Pro, because I think they do a great job of bringing in stars and mixing them in. They've built their own stars. But come on. I mean, you go to 90% of the... I went to an indie show here in, in Nashville a couple weeks ago. I lasted one and a half matches. There were 75 people in the crowd, and the first three matches were guys that came out to Leonard Skinner. They had the same music in two of the first three matches, and the guys came out wearing black sweatpants, Converse sneakers, and one guy wore a bandana on his arm, one guy wore it on his head. They were a tight team. And I just looked, and I, and I, I walked out the door, and I said, this, this is what we've become. This is, this is the joke, 
And this is 